Welcome again. In our readings, we are at John chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading from verses 11 to 15. Now, in this context, uh, if, if you listen to the uh, teaching before this, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nic- Nicodemus is a Pharisee and a leader in Israel. So Nicodemus was rebuked by Jesus. He just got rebuked by Jesus for not knowing about being born again. Okay, that's another whole teaching all by itself. If you didn't hear the previous teaching, I encourage you to go back, actually pause this and go back and listen to the previous teaching so you get it all in context and you also get the whole point of, uh, of how and why Nicodemus was rebuked for not knowing about being born again. Think about it. This was... What a lot of people, this is what a lot of people think is uh, just New Testament. But Jesus rebuked Nicodemus for not knowing about being born again before the New Testament was even written. So this, you got to understand that. So in that context, Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus. So let's read it. Verse 11. Most certainly I tell you, this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. We speak that which we know and testify of that which we have seen and you don't receive our witness. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, we know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about and you don't receive our witness. What we, we testify of what we have seen. This is not just what we speculate. This is just not what we think, but this is what we have seen and this is what we have known. Let's go on. Verse 12, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how would you believe if I told you heavenly things? This is obviously uh, by implication saying that the heavenly things are much deeper and more, you know, more difficult to understand, much more complicated in a sense than earthly things. So earthly things are kind of the lower uh, reality, you might call it. And heavenly things are the more deep things of God, okay? So Jesus said, if you don't, uh, if you don't believe and you don't understand the earthly things, then how can you understand the heavenly things? Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended out of heaven, the son of man who is in heaven. Hmm. Now, this is a very, this is again, this is a very meaty passage right here. Actually, a very meaty verse, I should say, because Jesus is saying no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended out of heaven, even the son of man, who is in heaven. So when he says the son of man, everybody knows, and I mean, most Christian scholars, if not all Christian scholars, would agree that when Jesus is talking about the son of man, he's talking about himself. The son of man is a direct uh, direct reference to the Messiah. Uh, a son of man, literally Ben Adam, uh, son of Adam or seed of Adam, which takes you right back to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve sinned and where God promised that the seed would be the Messiah who would crush the serpent's head, okay? So the term son of man here is speaking about Messiah, okay? So he says that Messiah is in heaven. Hmm, very, very interesting. And this this brings another whole point here that uh, we know by the scriptures that there are multiple heavens. There are different kinds of heavens. There is the... uh, the heaven that we know of as such as the sky or as space, okay? That could be uh, considered to be heaven. There's also the heaven that we refer to such as the abode of God, where the throne of God is, where people go when they die and such and so on and so forth. But then there's the heaven that is kind of overlaying this reality, this earth, okay? So, you know, in the scriptures, later on in the scriptures, we're going to be reading that we are seated in the heavenly realms right now, okay? We are seated with him in the heavenly realms. That's what Paul said, and we'll get to that later. But you need to understand that there are different kinds of heaven, different types of heaven. There's the physical or the more, I guess the, you might call it the more material cosmos heaven, such as the sky, the stars, and and the space and that kind of thing. Then there's the heaven that is beyond, which no one knows exactly where it is physically. However, uh, it's a place where people go when they die, like that kind of heaven where God's throne is, where paradise is. And then there's the heaven that we can be seated in, in this time and in this age, at this present time. Okay? 
So it's uh, Yeshua here said, Jesus said that the Son of Man is in heaven. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In some Christian circles today, the term lifted up means to praise or to sing about, you know, like lift him up, lift his name up. And we have, you know, Christian, um, contemporary Christian songs that say, lift his name up high, lift up Jesus. Jesus, we lift you, we lift your name on high, you know, lift him up, this kind of stuff. That interpretation of that phrase, lift him up, is, is, is actually uh, erroneous. It's not the correct interpretation. Uh, the term lift him up, we see this in other scripture, we see this in other passages of, of scripture, the term lift him up means for him to be lifted up on the cross, crucified. Because we see this in other in, in other passages of Scripture where Jesus said that he that the Son of Man will be lifted up and the disciples knew what he meant. Jesus said here, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with the story, uh, when uh, when Moses was with the children of Israel in the wilderness um, after they came out of Egypt, uh, there was a plague of like snakes that came that went around through. Uh, all of the hundreds of thousands or millions of the children of Israel and bit a lot of these people. And they were deadly snakes. So Moses took uh, a pole uh, and put a bronze serpent on this pole, okay? And lifted it up high and everybody who looked at that serpent lived, okay? Now you need to understand that bronze actually signifies sin as well. You notice uh, in the temple, and we're gonna get to this as well, there are different metals, different kinds of metals representing different things. Of, of course, gold is representing the holy things, whereas bronze represents the, it's like the sinful thing, okay? So Jesus said, as Moses lifted up that bronze serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, see, on a pole, on a crucified, on the tree, or on a cross, whatever the case may be. Um, that who, whosoever believes on him will not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so you need to understand that Jesus here is likening himself, at least the crucified Christ, likening the crucified Messiah to a serpent. As Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so the Son of Man, Messiah, will be lifted up crucified and everybody who looks shall live, okay? Everybody who believes on him looks and live, shall live. So, this is very significant because Jesus is, 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 is touching on a very profound uh, truth here in the spiritual realm, and that is when he was crucified, he became as a serpent. Now, a serpent is a symbol of sin, Bronze, again, like I told you, that metal is a symbol of sin. But let's go to one of uh, Paul's letters and let's read it for ourselves how the Messiah became as a serpent, became as sin. Let's go on over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For him who knew no sin, this is Yeshua, this is Jesus, for him who knew no sin, Jesus, he, that's God, made to be sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, so it says, he who knew no sin, he who was sinless, the this, this sinless, spotless lamb, Yeshua, Jesus, he who knew no sin, God made him to be sin on our behalf. So when he was crucified, he became sin. Why? You say, what? That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. How can the son of God, how can the sinless spotless lamb become sin? Well, look at this. Again, Jesus likened himself to the serpent. Okay? We just read this in John chapter three. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so I will be lifted up more or less on the cross. Okay, he, whoever, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. So 
again, there's a whole lot when it comes to, I mean, the, the term believe there is means a whole lot more than just mental acknowledgement. We're going to get to that uh, in the next session. But um, it's very important to understand that Jesus became sin. So those of you who are struggling with sin, those of you who have sin in your life, and you want to rid yourself of that sin, but you're having a hard time, you need to understand when you look upon Jesus on the cross, and you need to look by faith, not looking at some kind of picture where Jesus is just barely bleeding, just a little bit of blood coming off of each palm, a little bit of blood off the forehead. That's not the way it was, okay? He was torn apart. It says in the book of Isaiah, they basically tore him, tore him right apart. It says uh, in the uh, it says elsewhere in the scripture that his back became was plowed. They say they used a Roman cat of nine tails in those days. Roman cat of nine tails is a whip that was nine strands to this whip, and on the end of each one of these strands, they tied like pieces of metal or glass or whatever. So when they whipped people with it, it dug right into their their, their flesh. It dug right into their skin, and when they pulled it back. It, uh, it ripped their skin right off. No wonder it says in the scriptures that his beard was torn right off of him. Okay, not only that, but he was crucified completely naked. Remember, they they tore all of it. They took all of his garments off. They cast lots for his garments. Crucifixion on the cross was the most horrific, most humiliating thing that could ever happen to to a human being publicly. Okay, so it was horrific. Okay, Jesus became sin for us. So that at, when we look upon him, we can say, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I n now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he rose, as it says in the scriptures, we rose with him in newness of life. That's being born again. When he rose, we rose with him in newness of life. In addition to that, Notice in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, Paul made it very clear that he who is Christ, he who belongs to Christ, he who is the possession, if, if, if Christ has you in possession, if you belong to him, you have, notice, have crucified your sinful nature with its passions and its desires, okay? So that's what Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says. So that when you look upon Jesus that's crucified, you can say, there is my sin on the cross. When Jesus died, you can say, my sin died. When Jesus rose again, you can say, I rose in newness of life. To see Jesus on the cross as your sin, as sin on the cross, is very, very important. Because you need to realize, he became sin. He became sin, as it says here, so that you might become the righteousness of God. How can you become the righteousness of God? By identifying with Jesus on the cross. I am crucified with him. My sinful self died with him. My sin died when he died. And because I died with him, because I'm crucified with Christ, as Romans chapter 6 says, how can you, who are dead to sin, live in it any longer? Meaning that you are alive to God and you are living pure and holy according to the law of God by the power of God and by the presence of his spirit living in you because you have identified with his death your sin has died your sinful self your old sinful nature has died you you have crucified your lusts you have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires and you are risen with him. The Spirit of God has come into you. You are born again. And now you live righteous before God. That's how you become the righteousness of God in him. May God give you understanding to understand and to see the depths and the truth that is being presented to you as I speak. And God, open the eyes of your understanding and show you great and mighty things, give you great spiritual revelation beyond that of all your peers. Thanks again for listening. And may the Lord Jesus HaMashiach bless you abundantly as you seek him and yield yourself to him and obey him. Amen.